Hey soldiers, is the U.S. economy insolvent? Well, Peter Schiff sure seems to think so, as do I. I have for a long time. The data doesn't lie. We'll go over it. But most importantly, we're going to look at this situation and understand what we need to do to best position ourselves for the impending insolvency of America. Now, this is not going to be a light switch. This is something that's going to uh, progress over time. We're already feeling some of the effects of it. Okay, but get ready because the credit card is about to be declined. I'm sorry, Mr. Johnson. Uh, this card's been canceled. Impossible. Well, I tried it twice. Uh, do you have another form of payment? Try it again. Now, it's also true that the Congressional Budget Office, the nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office, has also come forward and they've said, hey, look, the music's about to stop because your debt is about to double. Now, when we talk about the national debt, I want you to understand something. There's a popular number that is reported. It's in the area of $30 trillion. As you can see from this uh, national debt clock, we use this a lot. You can see this debt is running up uh, at a prodigious clip, uh, $30 trillion. That's what it says, right? But it doesn't include several important factors. Let's hear from Peter Schiff, see what he has to say about it. That is only the Treasury debt that's outstanding. So that's bonded, funded debt, where the government has borrowed money and issued a formal IOU in the form of a Treasury security. But those are not the only debts that the U.S. government is obligated to repay, right? If you look at all of the debt that we're on the hook for, right, the unfunded liabilities, which would include commitments to pay Social Security benefits, Medicare benefits, pensions to uh, uh, government retirees. And then if you look at a lot of debt that the U.S. government has guaranteed, uh, such as student loans, or mortgages or things like that and you try to ascribe uh, some type of liability for that because we know that some of the debts are going to go bad and the government is going to be on the hook uh, based on its prior commitments so if you actually take a fair accounting of the unfunded liabilities there you're talking about like 150 trillion dollars so you're talking about a number uh, that is more than five times greater uh, than the official national debt. Okay, so when you add in those what are called unfunded liabilities of Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security, we see how the number just becomes astronomical and just totally, you know, unfathomable in terms of thinking about how to pay this money back. But the United States is going to sputter uh, in that direction, and they're going to do something key that's going to affect your wallet. Let's go over the report that the Congressional Budget Office put, put together and understand kind of how this looks and, and what we're going to need to do about it. Now, first and foremost, uh, the debt will double in size by 2052. That is what the Congressional Budget Office is saying. They expect that the debt held by the public will climb from 97.9% of gross domestic product in 2022 to 8% to 185% in 2052. Now, um, if we go back to the video and we go back to, let's just pull this up again, the uh, national debt clock, we see that the debt to GDP ratio is already over 97.9%. Okay. So we're, we're kind of ahead of things. So will it take to 2052 for this situation to manifest? Well, if we just look at this one figure alone, the debt GDP ratio, we're already well above what the Congress, what the uh, Congressional Budget Office forecasts for 2022. All right. Next up, we got to take a look at the fact that there's an ongoing mismatch between revenues and spending. And that is how you get that, you know, jet, uh, debt to GDP ratio that is out of whack. Uh, the pandemic that we had and all of the stimulus that we put out exacerbated the nation's fiscal trajectory. But the more consequential underlying problem is the structural mismatch between spending and revenues, which will be the primary driver behind growing deficits in the future. Now, 
I want you to understand something very key here because sometimes people use these terms interchangeably. So we're going to talk about the difference between the debt and the deficit. Now, the debt is simple. You know, it's just what we owe. The deficit is the difference between what the government takes in and what it actually owes. OK, so let's just say that um, again, we go back to that debt to GDP ratio. Let's just let's just say, for example, we take in a trillion dollars a year. OK, let's just use that round number. But we actually owe one point two uh, trillion. So the deficit would be the difference between what we owe and uh, what we generate. So your personal economy could be in a deficit, operating in a deficit. And you know that personally, if you're operating in a deficit, that's an untenable position to be in for us uh, consumers, for us citizens. Now, the government has a tool that they can use that makes this um, possible for them in the short term relatively short term uh, of about 70 to 90 years. And that is a printing press. The United States government does operate the world's reserve currency, the U.S. dollar, which is held in reserve uh, by many countries. Somewhere in the neighborhood of a uh, high 50% range of uh, the world's reserves are made up of U.S. dollars. So as long as we have that status and we have this printing press where we can just call Jerome Powell and get him to, you know, put some more money into the system, then uh, we have pretty much a blank check. But as you can see from the debt and from the deficit, this situation is becoming quite the problem. Now, this has happened with every culture who has had a reserve currency. We as humans, we get these blank checks. We get these uh, credit cards with the uh, unlimited limit on it and uh, unlimited limit. Well, uh, unlimited credit cards and we go hog. Wow. It's just human nature. OK, so the United States is not immune from that. OK, one thing that I think the CBO, the Congressional Budget Office, uh, I think they're behind the curve on their expectation of how uh, prodigiously taxes will rise. Now, if you look at this chart, we have spending versus revenues. Now, revenues is the word that the government likes to use in order to um, trick you into believing that. It's something other than what it is, which is taxes. So we see the blue line is representative of taxes. And we see that that's not growing as uh, steeply as the spending curve. However, I think that as we lose reserve currency status, we can expect that number to go uh, from where it is now down to below 50 percent, somewhere around the 2035 uh, time frame. That is my estimate. Uh, I think I'm I think I might be off. I think it might happen sooner, but I'm I'm still banking on 2035 for us to slip for the dollar. That is to slip below uh, 50 percent of reserves held globally. So I think that we're going to see these deficits uh, in debt grow. Well, we're definitely going to see that, but we're going to see the tax uh, obligations grow. So now you need to be in a position to sidestep that legally. We're going to talk about that in just a minute. And the other thing you have to keep in mind is the fact that we're looking at this from a federal taxation perspective, uh, by and large, in this video. But remember, the states, they also have the authority to tax you. So there has to be some mechanism for you to be able to hold on to some of your money as uh, this situation worsens. Now, this is a small channel. Not everybody's going to do this. Soldiers of finance, we're a tight knit group here. We are uh, the special forces of finance, as it were. We're not, you know, we're not a lot of people. So there's no need to uh, think that the whole population is going to do this because the whole population has been trained pretty much to be consumers and profligate spenders uh, and very conspicuous in their spending habits. But what we do here is we purchase assets. And we do that so that we can enjoy uh, financial independence. That doesn't mean we live like paupers, okay? But it does mean that we're able to watch our assets grow and keep them safe from all sorts of things like taxation. And we do so legally. Now, another worry that you have to concern yourself with is interest. Uh, as the debt situation continues to rise, uh, growth in that debt and rising interest rates will push up interest costs substantially over the 30-year horizon. 
And let me stop right there and say, if someone out there is saying, un unless you're 70, okay, and even then, I don't know, you still could be around in 30 years, okay? Medical science is getting better and better every day. People are living longer uh, all over the world. So don't look at this and say, well, uh, in 30 years, I won't even be here. Now, for a lot of you who are in your 30, you're in your 30s right now, in your 40s, oh, you will be here. And you better make sure that you are not in a position where you have to go out and be uh, a Walmart greeter. Now, no shade to the people who work at Walmart, but I can guarantee you that if you have worked 30 to 40 years and you're supposed to be retired, the last thing you want to do is get up and go to a Walmart and deal with the American public uh, for eight hours a day. I don't even like going to Walmart just for the 10 minutes I'm there shopping, okay? So we want to protect our soldiers of finance, our family, our friends from that type of eventuality. So we must understand that the CBO projects that the interest cost will grow dramatically on this debt from 1.6% of GDP in 2022 to 7.2% .2 in 2052. In the past, that, that again will lead us into some tax increases. In the past 50 years, net interest has averaged 2% of GDP. The high for the category was 3.2% in 1991. So, um, the fact that the interest will become uh, the fastest growing component of the budget, that is really, really worrying, okay? The fastest growing component, it'll accelerate past what we're spending on Social Security even, okay? Very, very troubling. Debt could be even higher if the interest rates exceed projections. So if interest rates are higher than what was projected uh, by the CBO, and by the Fed, then, of course, if your interest rate on your credit card goes from 10% to 15%, then all of a sudden, you're paying more on that debt than you were last month. The same macroeconomic concept is true for the United States of America, the country that gets its money from you, the taxpayer. So leading into now what we're going to talk about in terms of how to protect yourself. There are several ways. We talk about many on the channel uh, a lot. Roth IRA. Uh, permanent life insurance policy. Let me give you a couple of others. Now, with regard to real estate, okay, if you are investing in real estate, uh, there's a such thing as a 1031 exchange. And the 1031 exchange allows you to uh, purchase a property and then not be taxed on the sale of that property once you, you know, complete the sale. If you buy a like kind or better property. So you can continually move up in terms of purchasing, let's say, rental property or some type of commercial property. You can continually sidestep taxation. And again, you've got to speak to a CPA about this so that they can instruct you with regard to your specific situation. As always, do your due diligence. But this is a method that the IRS tax code says you can employ to defer taxation. Now, while you're doing that, what's particularly interesting and attractive is that while you're doing that under the real estate umbrella, you are also enjoying all of the other tax benefits that come with an income producing piece of real estate. Appreciation, depreciation, uh, you can leverage it and borrow against it uh, and Remember, borrowing against it uh, puts you in a situation where, uh, in most cases, you will not have to uh, pay taxes on money that's lent to you. Now, anything can change. This is why it's important for you to be able to understand who you're voting for. As I always say, just because they come to your church and kiss a few babies does not mean you should cast a vote for them. You've really got to look at their stance on the economy and whether or not they even understand it. OK, because anything can change when these guys get into a legislative session, your life and your liberty and your pursuit of property are all at risk when these people meet in these legislatures. But for now, the 1031 exchange is something that will allow you to um, defer taxes. Now, uh, once you have been able to do that, and at some point, of course, the IRS is going to want their money, you need to talk to your CPA about how you handle that if you want to uh, pass this property on. Now, in an insurance policy, once again, that benefit, once it pays out, in most cases, is going to do so 
without a tax obligation. Okay. Uh, and that also has an exchange in it called the 1035 exchange where you can change from one insurance policy to another one that might be more beneficial to you in terms of its uh, cash appreciation. Uh, and it, you can make that move without incurring a tax. All right. So all things that you need to speak with your experts about if you want more information. The bottom line is you're going to have to think on your feet because as we've seen, taxes are going to go up as the situation with the dollar becomes more untenable. And look, we're not the only people studying this, okay? Around the world, governments are looking at the situation with the U.S. dollar and they're becoming more and more uncomfortable. Case in point, not only has Turkey agreed to adopt the Russian payment system called MIR, which is kind of a... Um, replacement or a substitute rather for the SWIFT system that uh, Russia was booted out of. Not only has Turkey agreed to work with Russia in that system, but Turkey has also agreed to transact Russian oil in rubles. So what's interesting about that is Turkey is a NATO member. Okay. And NATO is, you know, in this whole thing against Russia right now. So they're cracks that have developed in that relationship because Turkey is looking at this situation with the dollar, with the fact that the West has said NATO and the EU and the United States have uh, cracked down on uh, the Russian economy via sanctions. Uh, and other countries are looking at it and saying, well, I don't want that to happen to us. So they're diversifying. And that diversification is going to be the death by a thousand cuts that takes the dollar below the 50% level when we're talking about uh, how much of it is held in reserve currencies throughout the world. All right, guys. So you have got to get it in your mind that these taxes are going up. If you want to have any money to go forward and build your own financial independence for you and your family, leave a legacy behind, enjoy life, then you're going to have to take seriously taxation. And other concepts like interest uh, as well. Interest in the form of uh, the rates that are going up to quell inflation. Let's see how that works out. Okay, soldiers, at this point, what I want you to do is I want you to watch this video. This video is going to talk to you about how the Biden administration is weaponizing the IRS against you, against the American citizen, under the guise of the Inflation Reduction Act, the misappropriately named Inflation Reduction Act. Now... I want you to understand what you're up against because they're going to get this money. Now, if you work within the rules and the laws that exist, you can opt out of what is going to hit a lot of other people, most other Americans. Watch this video. Find out more. I'll talk to you soon.